Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our Inequality Colloquium today. Today is May 7. Um, my name is Marco Bichnell. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here affiliated with the cluster, as well as with the Chair of Sociology with a focus on social movements. And I have today the honor and the privilege to introduce our esteemed guest today, uh, Lane Kenworthy who is a professor of sociology from UC San Diego. And as you can see, he's joining us online today. Uh, I assume from California? Yes, yes. Oh, wonderful. And given that it's like around, I think, uh, 6 a.m. in California, so we are very grateful that you still made it to deliver your talk um, with a title that may appear provocative to some of us, perhaps, both normatively and empirically, is inequality the problem? So Lane is, uh, as I said, a STEAM researcher, has written extensively about issues of poverty, of welfare, of inequality, obviously. His most recent books include uh, is Democratic... Well, some other, uh, title all sound the same, so I'm getting <laughs> confused here. Would democratic socialism be better, I think, is the most recent one published with Oxford University Press, and the book before was um, Democratic, Social Democratic Capitalism. No, I got them right, I hope. So yeah. without further ado, I think we are all looking forward to an intriguing presentation and hopefully a stimulating discussion afterwards. So Lane, the floor is yours. Just start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks very much for having me. I really wish I could be there in person, but it, it unfortunately just didn't work out. And uh, I should say it is early here, but I'm an early riser, so it's not really a big deal. And I was planning, in fact, to drive into my office um, to do this. But it just so happened that yesterday, the administration on my campus decided to uh, uh, end the encampment, uh, similar to ones that have been going on in a lot of campuses around the United States. So the whole campus was shut down and as far as I know is still closed. So I'm back to uh, working in a bedroom. Feels like uh, back during COVID, uh, but I, I hope this will work well enough for all of you. Yeah, you wanna? He's just introducing himself. Do you wanna, let me know if you wanna, yeah. Great. Everything okay? Yeah, yeah. I think we were just somebody else interrupting you from the audience. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Hope you apologize, sure. that. No problem. No problem. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, this is uh, this talk is based on a, a book manuscript that uh, is written but not published. So I'm uh, very much hopeful to get whatever feedback you you feel like you can give. Uh, small, medium, uh, or quite large. I, I have plenty of uh, time and opportunity to uh, revise this. And in fact, it's uh, it's really a, been a long-term ongoing project. I, I started thinking about writing a book along these lines, uh, I think maybe 15 years ago, and ended up writing a manuscript somewhere around 2013 or 14, and then decided not to do anything with it because uh, there was so much research coming out. Uh, I, you know, I was worried I would have the story very wrong. Uh, so I, I put it off to the side. Now I've come back to it. Um, but okay. Um, whoops. Make sure I can. Uh oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so uh, just to be clear, the the inequality that I'm going to focus on here is mostly uh, income because that's what we have the most data for. Uh, a little bit, I'll say a, a, just a little bit about wealth, um, but the the emphasis here is not on differences between particular groups, men or women, native born immigrants, and so on, but the the overall uh, amount of inequality in the society as a whole, top, middle, bottom, and and so on. So. Like I'm guessing a number of you in the audience, uh, I'm pretty convinced by the the ethical or normative argument that a high level of income or wealth inequality is unfair. That's because most of what determines where uh, any particular person or household ends up in the distribution is arbitrary from a moral point of view. We have little control over it. 
It's not that there's no free will, uh, but uh, but a lot is determined outside our control. And so a lot of the inequality we observe is unjustified. Um, but the in the last, I would say roughly 20 years, uh, uh, a newer argument, I think, has come up alongside the standard normative argument. In fact, here in the United States, on the left side of the political spectrum, both in academia and in politics, I would say this has now displaced the ethical argument or maybe overshadowed it. And this is the argument that uh, particularly income inequality has harmful effects on a bunch of other outcomes that we care about from health to democracy to living standards and so on. I'm going to focus on five of them, which I'll get to in, in just a second. If this is correct, the the argument for the case for reducing inequality surely is much stronger. Um, I happen to think it's strong enough with the ethical argument, but it's, it's uh, at least in the eyes of many people, probably much stronger if this inequality is harmful hypothesis is correct. And so a, a good chunk of what I try to do in this book is assess the, the evidence uh, uh, with respect to this hypothesis. Um, so one of the things I want to argue is that in order to really assess this hypothesis, there are all kinds of ways to study the consequences or effects of inequality. Uh, but I think that we can't ignore the evidence from countries. And indeed, I think that should be the, 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 the most important source of evidence for, uh, for evaluating this hypothesis. That when people put forward this, this view that income inequality has harmful consequences, what they're mainly suggesting is that if a particular country has more income inequality than another, then its outcomes, whether again, talking about democracy or longevity or, or whatever, are likely to be worse. Or that if income inequality increases over time, other outcomes are likely to worsen. And while studying individuals or theorizing, running experiments, studying subnational units, all of that's interesting, potentially informative. Ultimately, I think we need to look at the, the country level uh, in order to to uh, to judge this, especially if we're interested in policy, because most of the relevant, not all, but most of the relevant levers for influencing income inequality are at the level of national governments, uh, again, rather than subnational governments or neighborhoods or individuals. So um, I'm going to focus here on uh, the rich, longstanding, most of the rich, longstanding democratic nations. And I'll focus on the, the era or the period of rising uh, and higher income inequality, which is roughly from 1979 to 2019. So right up until the, the peak of the business cycle before the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have uh, pretty good uh, comparable data uh, for these countries in these years. And uh, although I don't wanna go into it here, I think there's good reason to expect causal patterns to be different in poor and middle income nations. So even if we had comparable data, I think there's a, a good argument for just focusing on the rich longstanding democracies. Um, we have two measures of income inequality that are, um, that we should pay attention to, I think. Uh, I'm guessing these are familiar to most, if not all of you. So one is the top 1% income share this focuses on the difference between uh, the top 1% and everybody else. The data come mainly for tax records. They're pre-tax, which is a limitation, but, uh, but those are the only uh, comparable data we have for a number of, of countries. Um, and because these are based on tax records, they basically can go back to whenever countries began their income tax. Uh, and so this is the, the basic pattern, and you can see the familiar break point around 1979. So decreasing inequality in most of these countries, then somewhere around 79 or 80 or in the early 1980s, it begins to rise in most of the countries, most prominently in the United States, which I'll, I'll come back to. Um, the other uh, uh, type of measure is usually a Gini coefficient. It doesn't have to be. Um, this is mainly getting at income inequality within the bottom 99% because these data come from uh, from surveys of the population. Generally, they're top-coded because the, the data aren't particularly good. 
uh, or they're too sparse for those at the very top of the distribution. So typically we cut out the top one or 2% or so. Um, these don't go back nearly as far in time, again, because they're based on, uh, on surveys done by governments or government agencies. Um, but roughly speaking, they tell a, a similar story of a low point around 1979 and then increases in, in many of the countries. A, a key and important point here, though, is that the, the degree of variation across countries is uh, that, that there is variation in the, the rise across countries. Um, I'll, I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, so it would be nice if we had a single unified measure. And in fact, some social scientists are now trying to, to merge these two types of data. Again, one coming from income tax records, the other from, uh, from surveys. In the United States, the Congressional Budget Office has been doing this for about 30 or so years, although there are limits to that. And some others are, are trying to do this. Um, that's probably helpful. Um, but I'm not sure even when we can, when we have those data for a, a large number of countries and we consider them relatively good, I'm not sure we'll necessarily want to combine them because the, the two sources tell uh, different stories for a particular country. So depending on which measure you use here, so in this chart, the bottom 99% inequality measures on the horizontal axis and the top 1%, which again is telling us about inequality between the, the top one and the, the rest of society that's on the vertical. For some of these countries, you get a very different picture depending on which of these two measures you look at. And the same is true, this, so this is levels, this is an average over the 79 to, to 2019 period, and this is changes during that period. There's even more uh, spread, so the stories are even more different depending on which of the two measures you choose. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna use both. Um, this is just by way of suggesting that it's not solely because of data limitations or data constraints that, that we might wanna look at both of these measures. Um, I'm gonna show you information that looks at levels. So levels of inequality and how they correlate or don't correlate with levels in, in various outcomes. But I think we probably wanna trust the story of overtime change or country differences in overtime change more. Uh, in principle, this is better evidence because it takes constant, sometimes hard to measure, uh, uh, potentially important factors. Traditionally, we talk about things like culture, but there might be others. It takes them out of play. Uh, in order to do this kind of difference in differences or quasi-experimental uh, approach. Uh, it's helpful to have uh, overtime change in the hypothesized cause, uh, variation across units, in this case countries in that change, and ideally what you want is a unidirectional rather than lots of movement up and down in the change. It just so happens that for income inequality in the world's rich nations, we that's exactly what we have. You, you could see that on the, the couple of overtime charts that I showed earlier. Um, it's of course possible to do this kind of thing with yearly data or five-year uh, periods or business cycle periods. I'm gonna focus because it, there's a, a real possibility that impacts or effects of of income inequality will take a, a good while to play out. I'm gonna focus on this relatively lengthy 40 year period under the assumption that if income inequality is gonna have an effect, it's likely to, we probably wouldn't expect its effect, to, depending on the hypothesized causal pathway, wouldn't, wouldn't expect its effect to be immediate or instantaneous, but 40 years is a, a fairly long period of time. I think it's reasonable to expect that it would show up uh, over this long enough period. Um, I include a variety of controls. You know, there's a limit to what you can do with a small number of countries. I include some controls, but I'm not going to make a big deal of this here, and, except in the, the rare case where it actually changes the, the story. Um, okay, so let me start with, I, as I said earlier, I'm going to look at five uh, key outcomes, although there are a variety of indicators within each of these. So I'm going to start with living standards and say something about democracy, opportunity, uh, health with a focus on longevity, 
and then happiness. But I'm, I may just skim over some of this. I want to make sure I keep within the time limit, especially because I'm really interested to, to hear what you say. And uh, and also, I'm very, very happy to share the manuscript with anyone who is interested in the, the re de real details. So if I do skip over, feel free to ask me about something I've skipped or or I can just send you the uh, the thing. OK, I'm going to start with living standards and uh, and just look at four economic growth, um, absolute levels of low end incomes. Uh, I'll use the 10th percentile here, middle class incomes. I'll use the median income. Uh, there and then household balance sheets. So the sort of balance of saving versus uh, debt, which is, has been hypothesized to, to be influenced by uh, income inequality. And I'm going to not spend a lot of time on the details of the empirics. Um, the simple story here. So we, we, we would expect if income inequality has a harmful effect on economic growth, we'd expect that countries with higher levels of income inequality would tend to have slower economic growth during this period. They haven't. Um, we would also expect that countries with larger increases in, in income inequality would have had larger uh, decreases in economic growth uh, in terms of changes in economic growth over the time period. That also hasn't happened. So here, simple scatter plots showing levels. And I'm going to show you a lot of these types of scatter plots. So in each case, I'll include two. They differ just uh, in terms of the income inequality measures. So the top 1% is on the left here. The, those are on the horizontal axes. And the bottom 99%, which is a, a Gini coefficient, that's over in the right chart. The economic growth measure here is adjusted for starting point because um, uh, we observe a, a catch-up effect across these countries. So countries that start with a lower GDP per capita almost always tend to grow more rapidly uh, during subsequent years. This is this has been pretty common ever really ever since World War II. Um, but again, these are these are data for 1979 to 2019, and you just don't see any any association here. And I can't get an association. Uh, that's uh, in any way meaningful or interesting by by including uh, potential confounding variables. Same story when you look at changes in economic growth during this period. And in most of these countries, there are a few exceptions. In most of these countries, growth slowed uh, from the 80s and 90s to the 2000s and 2010s, uh, in part because of the, the large downturn in 2008 uh, and subsequent years, but not only for that reason. But in any case, no association between changes in income inequality over the course of this period and changes in economic growth. Um, okay, what about low end incomes? And again, I'm looking at absolute levels here, uh, not, a, like a, not a relative poverty measure. Um, do countries with higher levels of income inequality tend to have lower absolute uh, incomes, incomes at the 10th percentile? Yeah, as you'll see in just a second, there is a correlation here, but but it turns out when you control for some other things, this uh, largely goes away. Uh, and we only see it in one of the two measures of uh, of income inequality. And then we don't, uh, and that's the one on the right here with inequality measured within the bottom 99% using a, a Gini coefficient. Uh, there's really nothing worth uh, uh, um, noticing or paying attention to in the in the chart on the left. Um, um, but a, an even clearer test, I think, is to look at changes. And again, once we do that, there's just no association between the two. So again, this is changes in income inequality on the horizontal axes and changes in absolute uh, 10th percentile in household incomes um, on the vertical axes. Uh, similar story when we look at median incomes. Uh, I, by the way, I haven't run through the hypotheses here. Um, I, I can say more about them if you want. There are several causal pathways through which some researchers predict that economic growth will be slower with higher income inequality. Uh, and it's really easy to think of why we might expect Middle class income levels, or growth in middle class income, or uh, or the incomes of those at the bottom of the distribution, that they would be linked to income inequality, but empirically they they simply haven't been. Um, I guess I want to say one thing there, and I'll go back to the low end incomes. 
the main reason, as far as I can tell, why we don't observe a, an association here is because uh, changes in low-end incomes over the last 40 years tend to be driven by government policy. So uh, uh, a significant and in some countries rising share of incomes for those at the low end of the distribution. And this is really roughly the, the lowest quintile, which obviously includes the 10th percentile, um, is a function of government benefits. So a non-trivial fraction of people are retired or disabled or unemployed or in school or out of the labor force for other reasons. And so most, if not all of their income is gonna come from government benefits rather than from earnings. So that's the main determinant. And it turns out that in most of these countries, either explicit decisions or automatic changes uh, based on fluctuations in say the unemployment rate or, uh, or illness or disability uh, or economic downturns or, or whatever, um, these tend to be independent of income inequality. They don't seem to be affected much, if at all, by the level of inequality or changes in inequality. And so that's as best I could tell why we don't see any association. Um, okay, back to middle class incomes. Again, no association um, uh, uh, worth noticing or emphasizing. Um, and then they're also, uh, uh, I think, very plausible. And and I, I want to, I guess here stop and or pause and and say um i think a a lot of the if not all of the hypotheses that link income inequality with the, the kinds of outcomes that i'm going to be showing you and focusing on are quite plausible and so um my uh questioning of or disagreement with uh and you know, in the end, I do disagree with a lot of the research that's come out in, in these 20 or so years on consequences of income inequality has mostly simply to do with uh, the empirics. Uh, most of the, the hypotheses are plausible and, and pretty well thought through. When it comes to household balance sheets, so uh, one obvious one is that for people in the middle or lower ends of the income distribution, if their incomes are increasing less rapidly, if they were increasing less rapidly, we've just seen that, that they haven't on average. Uh, but if they were, uh, it'd be reasonable to expect they might engage in, in greater borrowing. Uh, there's another one uh, commonly, at least in the American literature, and that's associated with Robert Frank, an economist, which suggests that uh, because incomes and living standards are uh, are often relative goods, um, as the rich or upper middle class see their incomes increase quite rapidly, they tend to buy more stuff, bigger houses, fancier cars, uh, and so on. And, and that leads to a, a kind of ripple effect down the income distribution with middle class households feeling like they have to spend more to emulate uh, their upper middle class or, or rich neighbors or people they see on television or, or wherever they get the reference point from. And, uh, and so they have to borrow more in order to do this, uh, which ends up leading to less household, net household saving. And so net household savings, the measure that I'm gonna use here. But, but once again, we don't see any noteworthy association either in levels or in changes over time. Um, okay, so that's uh, the, the, the quick version of the story for uh, living standards. For democracy, which is also very commonly thought to be adversely affected or harmed by uh, high levels or rapid increases in income inequality, we don't have the kind of data we would need to do much in the way of cross-country quantitative comparison. What we need in order to do this is uh, a quantitative measure of inequality and in political influence by income. So uh, roughly speaking, the way social scientists are tending to measure this now, and this, by the way, is a pretty recent development prior to about 15 years ago, there really were no quantitative, good quantitative measures of uh, uh, relative influence on policy outcomes, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, at different levels of the income distribution. Um, but so 
One way to think about democracy is equality of influence, equality of opportunity, excuse me, to influence policy decisions. We don't expect everyone to have the same influence. Lots of people don't even vote, for example, but they, they need to have the opportunity to exert similar influence. But to the degree money matters, it's quite reasonable to expect that those that have more income uh, would be able to exert greater influence, whether that's for using it for campaign contributions, lobbying, uh, buying media, uh, uh, running as a candidate yourself and being able to spend more because you have more wealth or, or income and so on. Uh, so the, the way that social scientists typically do this now is to look at public opinion surveys on a, a range of uh, policy issues. They see what uh, the views are on average of people at different points in the income distribution and because public opinion surveys often aren't that large, usually this means just trying to gauge uh, the, the views on average of people at the top of the distribution, in the middle and at the bottom, and then see how this correlates with subsequent policy change or lack of policy change, again, on our range of issues. Uh, the best study on this in the United States is by Martin Gillens and a, a, a bunch of, uh, of graduate students who went back and, and looked at public opinion surveys, again, on a range of issues at various points in time, and, and then uh, tried to see how this correlated with subsequent policy change. And what they found, not surprisingly, is that policy change in the United States does correlate more with the views of those at the top of the income distribution rather than those in the middle and the bottom. Um, but we don't have comparable data on this for very many other countries, much less over time data. Uh, and so here I focus just on the United States and I try to puzzle through um, what we might expect to observe if the inequality is harmful hypothesis is correct um, and whether we in fact observe that. So for example, do higher income Americans have more influence on policy decisions than those with middle or low incomes? So I, as I just said, the answer pretty clearly seems to be yes, mainly from Gillen's data, a few other people, including Larry Bartels, another American political scientist and, and some others uh, have done similar, although less comprehensive studies. So, so that does seem to be true. Uh, and that's important to, to note, but a variety of other things we might expect to observe don't seem to to be true. So has the gap in political influence between the rich and the rest increased uh, during this period since, again, roughly the late 1970s as income inequality has increased? And according to Gillen's data, which don't cover the whole of this period, but cover a significant chunk of it, the answer is no. There's another study that looked only at opinions on social policy rather than a broad range of policies, but it, it came to a similar conclusion no real change over this period, even as income inequality increased quite a lot, much more in the United States than any other country, to the point where the U.S. alone among these countries, if, if you remember that uh, overtime graph on uh, top 1% share I showed earlier, is nearly back to the level we were at in terms of income inequality, the level we were at back in the 1920s. Uh, is the gap in political influence between the rich and the rest larger in the US than in other nations that have less economic inequality. Well, there, there are a couple of studies here, uh, including one by Larry Bartels that also just looked at social policy rather than a broad range of policies, but it, it seems to find really no noteworthy difference between the United States and, and other countries. So as best we can tell from very limited research, that too doesn't uh, conform with uh, the inequality is harmful hypothesis. Has some of the things we might expect the rich to want uh, in the United States uh, as they presumably, or at least hypothetically, got more political influence due to the increase in income inequality, uh, have those things decreased? Things like top-end tax rates or financial regulations uh, and unionization, have they decreased more in the United States than in late nations with less economic inequality? Well, surprisingly, uh, maybe to some of you, the answer is no, as best we can tell from the, the data. And also, interestingly, much of the change that did occur, especially with respect to top-end tax rates and financial regulation in the United States, happened right at the beginning of this period, before income inequality started to rise, not toward the middle or, or end of the period. Have Republicans, whose views correspond much more closely to the at least expressed uh, preferences and wishes of 
those with higher incomes, have they gotten more campaign money than Democrats in the United States? We have only these two political parties uh, and consequently win more elections during this era of high and rising inequality? No, they haven't actually. Uh, campaign contributions have been pretty balanced across the, the two parties. And uh, Democrats have gotten a majority in the popular vote in seven of the last eight presidential elections, most of the elections to the Senate. Now, because of oddities and quirks in our electoral system here, Democrats don't always end up holding the presidency, even when they win the popular vote. But um, but the, the big increase in income inequality hasn't seemed to, to have given a much of an advantage to Republicans electorally. Does policy in U.S. states with greater income inequality conform more to the preferences of the rich? No, as far as we can tell. The states with the highest income inequality are states like California and New York um, and Connecticut, states that are among today, Massachusetts, these are among the most left-leaning states uh, here in the U.S. Uh, politically. Uh, and then one other question here, have policy trends over the long run of American history corresponded to trends in economic inequality? So um, uh, Martin Gillens and a, a co-author have recently written a book where they uh, try to loosely kind of trace the correlation over time going back to the mid 1800s. Um, I think this is a, a reasonable thing to, to try to play around with, but, uh, but their story is actually less convincing, uh, I think, once you dig into the details than, than they, at least in the book, presented as. So uh, my, my key conclusion, my big conclusion here on democracy is that, yes, it's true that America's rich very likely, uh, almost certainly, I would say, have more influence on policy decisions than the, the non-rich, those in the middle and lower parts of the distribution do. But uh, probably because there are threshold effects here or a tipping point beyond which the impact of money in politics diminishes, it looks very much like affluent or rich Americans have no more political advantage today than they did back in the late 1970s or early 1980s before the large increase in income inequality, which if it's true, if this conclusion is correct, I think has a really important policy implication, which is that even if we were somehow to manage to go back to that late 1970s level, which was the, at least according to the data, we have the, the all time low point in income inequality in the United States, it might make no difference at all in the inequality of, of uh, influence over policy that exists in, in our political system. Um, okay, so it's 4.35 your time. Um, I think I wanna skip over this question of opportunity because it's a complicated one. And again, um, I focus mostly here uh, on the United States due to data limitations. Maybe I'll say something about health and then skip over to the rest of, uh, of what I wanna say. So, uh, but I'm happy to come back to that if you wanna ask about it. And again, I could just send you the, the manuscript if you wanna dig into the details on uh, inequality of opportunity. Um, so the, the link between or adverse effects of income inequality on health, um, measured mostly as life expectancy or longevity. I, I think this is probably the most heavily studied consequence uh, or, or outcome of all. The, the core hypotheses here or, or hypothesized pathways have to do with stress due to status comparison. So more income inequality. Uh, we're always comparing ourselves to others uh, as our reference group gets further away from us. This is likely to cause stress, which is bad for the body. Um, in addition, there's a, a hypothesized policy mechanism such that uh, in the way that I, I just talked about, if greater income inequality leads to more unequal political influence than the, the wishes of the rich, which have to do first and foremost with lower taxation, um, might lead to a weaker commitment to, uh, to health care healthcare, and therefore adverse effects on, on the health of the rest of the distribution. Okay, so I'm going to look at a variety of uh, contributors to longevity. I'll start with homicide um, and ask similar questions to those I asked before when I was looking at living standards. So do countries with higher levels of income inequality tend to have higher homicide rates? No, they don't, except for the United States, um, which 
probably won't surprise anyone there, um, have countries with larger increases in income inequality tended to have smaller decreases in homicides and, and homicide rates have fallen in most of these countries over this particular period from 1979 or so to 2019. This is the levels pattern and you can see the, the US case, an enormous outlier with very high homicide rate. Um, the change over time pattern uh, is very similar. You don't see any noteworthy impact. And here I'll, I'll just note that the US is an outlier in the other direction. Um, so homicide rates have fallen much more rapidly in the United States than anywhere else, despite our very high and, and rapidly rising income inequality, suggesting that this almost certainly has to do with other stuff, um, notably guns, but but uh, um, but probably other factors too that separates the United States from other countries. Um, what about obesity? This is another thing that's gotten a lot of attention. Um, that is to say the inequality is harmful hypothesis has gotten a fair amount of attention in the literature on the rise in obesity across these countries. Um, so once again, with respect to levels, we see little or no correlation apart from the position of the United States. Um, so this is the levels chart. And once again, the US stands out up here in the corner for both measures of income inequality um, when it comes to changes uh, we see something of an association here. That is to say, this is in the expected direction. Countries with a larger increase in top 1% income share have experienced a larger rise in obesity. The, the one problem here is that these countries in the upper right corner are all countries in which the, the supply of uh, tasty, high calorie, uh, inexpensive food seems to have increased most rapidly. We we have pretty good data for this in the United States. And so I'm quite convinced that this is mostly a supply story. This is the period when uh, all the hyper-processed food begins showing up in grocery stores, when there's a massive expansion of fast food restaurants in the United States and a big expansion of these large portion sit-down restaurants uh, like Cheesecake Factory and others. If you heard of these. So these begin to show up in mass in the United States. And we see something like this as best, uh, I think we can tell from the, the kind of qualitative descriptive stories in the other Anglo or English speaking countries. So there's good reason to expect that this is the real cause rather than the rise in, in income inequality. But we do see something like a, a cor the kind of correlation we'd expect um, here, although not in the other, for the other measure of uh, of income inequality. Um, I'll also note that um, if we try this same kind of analysis and, and do it for the US states, uh, we don't see any correlation either for levels or changes. That is to say, the American states in which income inequality has increased the most and is highest in level are not the, the states where we observe uh, any higher levels or faster increases in obesity during these years. Uh, for smoking, uh, again, no association here. Uh, in fact, if anything, it's slightly in opposite direction, but probably this is really just a flat line, both for levels and changes. Um, this story about deaths of despair, which uh, until very recently seems to have been mainly an American phenomenon, uh, has gotten a fair amount of attention. So I'll just kind of skip to the... the um, key point here is that when we look at changes over time, we do see a, a positive correlation. So this is a story of um, uh, more people being uh, depressed, gloomy about life, maybe because of uh, heavy loss of manufacturing jobs in your town or, or city. This is the uh, a principal part of the story told by Anne Case and Angus Deaton in their Deaths of Despair book and a, a series of papers that they've written over the last now, I guess, about nine years. Um, so these deaths are measured as deaths due to um, uh, drug overdose uh, or other types of accidental poisoning, suicide or uh, liver disease, which uh, mainly comes from uh, excessive consumption of, of alcohol. So there, it does look like there's a correlation. This is not just a US specific story here. On the other hand, the countries are really spread out here. Um, so yes, maybe a positive correlation, but not a particularly strong driver of the variation we see in, in deaths of despair. Um, uh, 
Moreover, um, deaths of despair actually decreased in nearly all of these countries. So what we're talking about is maybe uh, if income inequality has had an effect through this pathway, it's simply slowing the decrease rather than causing an increase in this type of, uh, or this source of, of mortality. Uh, and then I'll also note once again, that if we do the same kind of analysis within the United States, compare across states, or, or some have even tried to do this with commuting zones, we don't see uh, uh, the kind of correlation that showed up in this particular chart. But this is one possible way in which the, the income inequality harmful story um, does get some empirical support. Um, and then lastly, we'll look at overall life expectancy, so the, a more direct measure of longevity. And once again, here, we don't see any uh, um, support for the hypothesis, except when it comes to the United States. Um, so if the United States is telling us something informative here, uh, in terms of where it stands relative to the other countries about the, the impact of income inequality on longevity, then maybe there is some, some support. It's quite possible that uh, income inequality has little or no effect until you reach a certain level and the United States has reached that. Um, on the other hand, there's, there's, I think, reason to be skeptical because in the, for the, the types of uh, mortality or sources of mortality where the US stands apart, uh, there's a, a good alternative uh, explanation in each case. For homicides, uh, again, it's, it lacks regulation of guns. For obesity, it's this early and very large-scale expansion in the supply of obesity-causing foods. And for deaths of despair, there's a pretty well-known story about very weak regulation and very aggressive uh, pharmaceutical company marketing of opioid pain relievers. This tracks quite well with the geographical pattern uh, in terms of the rise of, of this uh, type of, uh, of death. This has loosened up recently because the, the sources have changed from opioid pain relievers themselves to initially heroin and now fentanyl, and it's become a, a countrywide and um, uh, phenomena and also a, a, a much larger one. But so I think there's reason to be skeptical about the the uh, the information that the U.S. is providing us and whether or not we should take its particular position relative to other countries as indicating that income inequality has, in fact, had a, a harmful effect. Uh, and I, I'll just lastly say that uh, if you're interested in COVID-19 deaths, once again, I guess I didn't include the charts here. There's no real pattern across countries. The United States, again, stands out in the predicted direction, but this is almost certainly a story not of income inequality, but just to the, the dynamics of American politics and the way the Republican Party pretty quickly jumped into a, a very strong anti-vaccine stance. That's largely what separates the United States from other countries in terms of our, our COVID deaths. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip over the story for happiness. Uh, I'll just say that the question I think um, uh, the, the interesting question to ask here is why uh, life satisfaction doesn't seem to have increased in all of the, the pretty much all of the rich, longstanding democratic countries since the 1970s, despite uh, sizable increases in GDP per capita and median incomes and the fact that we know life satisfaction correlates quite strongly at both the national level and the individual level with income. Uh, there's surely a threshold effect, but uh, uh, but nevertheless, we'd expect some increase during this period, and it, it just hasn't happened. Uh, it's possible that income inequality uh, has contributed to this. You do see a slight um, uh, correlation in the expected direction, uh, but very likely, if any effect here, this is a, a really small one. Um, and I, I don't personally think we have a very good answer to this question of, uh, uh, of why life satisfaction hasn't increased or hasn't increased very much uh, in this period of now 40 or in some countries, uh, 50 years. Okay, so let me just say a few more things and then I wanna stop and, uh, and try to answer any, any questions you, you might have or at the very least invite you to, to ask questions or, or 
or give me feedback or, or challenge what I say. But I want to say just a couple other things. Um, so I also try to, uh, in addition to assessing the, the, the hypothesis that income inequality has significant harmful consequences for things we care about, I look at uh, the public opinion data to, to see if, because I, and this is also a relevant question for the, the policy implications, which is what I really care about the most here. So do people want less inequality? So my sort of quick uh, and cursory summary of what the public opinion data tell us is that yes, uh, a lot of people in the rich countries would prefer less income inequality and are support, broadly supportive of government efforts to achieve it. But at the same time, for most people, this doesn't seem to be a high level concern. So for example, when, and this is just one example, when people are asked open-ended questions about what are the significant problems facing our country today, they very rarely mention income inequality. Uh, and when they do, it's way, way down the list uh, of things that they seem to care about. So, you know, I think the, again, the my overall summary uh, of what we know is that, yeah, people really do care about inequality. They'd like government to do something to reduce it. Um, but on the other hand, it's not first and foremost on their mind of what they want government to do or what they care about. Okay, there we go. Uh, a second thing here is um, everything I've said is focused just on income inequality in the, the rich countries. What about the rest of the world? Well, it's, it's pretty important to know that according to the the data that we have, which could, I will say, be uh, at least a little bit off and possibly altogether wrong because what scientists who are, are trying to give us a picture of worldwide income inequality have to do is essentially um, merge data on changes in GDP per capita with estimates of what those data tell us about uh, incomes for households in lots of poor and middle income countries around the world with uh, better data that we have on actual income distributions, which are pretty scant in a lot of the poor or low income countries. But as best we can tell, there's been a big drop in worldwide income inequality precisely during part of the period when inequality has been going up so much in the, the rich countries. I'll come back to, to one potential implication of this in just a moment. Uh, so I don't have much to say about wealth, but I do want to say just a couple of things. My uh, screen or page changer isn't working very well. So we don't have a whole lot of data. These are data from Piketty's uh, first book for just four countries showing a pattern pretty similar to income inequality, though not as much rise in the period since 1980. The OECD now has data for roughly 2010, uh, going forward for at least a handful of years for most of the countries. Um, I want to just mention two things about uh, what we see in these data. So in these recent data, one of the things we see is that Denmark, Norway, and Sweden have comparatively high levels of wealth inequality. It's not true for income inequality, although Norway in a couple of years jumps up. But for wealth inequality, they're fairly high, not compared to the United States, but compared to most of the other countries. And yet these are countries where, at least in my view, uh, uh, there's really, really good performance on some of the outcomes we care most about when it comes to things like living standards and economic well-being. So security, opportunity, uh, li uh, living standards of the least well-off and, and also happiness or, or life satisfaction. Here's one other thing worth noting. So. Uh, these are data on the bottom 50% wealth share in France. They go back a, a long time. It's the only, to my knowledge, the only country for which uh, there are uh, estimates that go back nearly this far in time. So if wealth inequality is a key determinant of living standards of uh, those at the low end or in the middle of the distribution, I think based on the fact that this hasn't really shifted much, I mean, it hovers around two, three, four, five percent of the total wealth in France throughout this whole period, I think what we'd expect is something like stagnation or very limited improvement in other indicators of economic well-being for the lower half of the French population since 1800. But that's not at all what we observe. There's been massive improvement in economic security, opportunity, housing, free time, lots of, of other things. Okay. Um, 
here are my conclusions, uh, the implications I take from this run through the, the data, and I'll, I'll try to be short here. Um, okay, so first, I don't think that we should presume that reducing income or probably wealth inequality is going to do a lot to help us solve other key problems. Um, I think if we want to make progress in living standards, democracy, opportunity, health, and happiness, our best bet is probably to try to address them directly rather than pursuing them indirectly through a reduction in income inequality or, or wealth inequality. I think the and this is independent of the analysis here, but I think our first uh, focus should be on raising the floor. Um, and one of the things that I think is likely to uh, uh, show up uh, in, um, in the, the public opinion data is that where a lot of life's basic needs and wants are taken care of through government public goods, services, and to some extent transfers, which will directly affect the income distribution, but the goods and services don't. Um, it's just not clear that a, a moderately high level of income or wealth inequality is particularly pro uh, problematic. And, and here too, I, I point to Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, especially where wealth inequality is comparatively high. And yet there isn't a whole lot of worry or, or complaining about this because so much of, uh, of the other wants and needs that we have are more or less taken care of. Um, third, I think we should pay more attention to the fact or emphasize more the fact that public services and goods reduce real inequality of living conditions, even though this doesn't show up in our measures. Um, I can say a little bit more about this. Maybe it's well known and uncontroversial to many of you, but you know, so one estimate, for example, suggests that if we were to include this in household income, they would reduce measured income inequality by about a fifth to a third and relative poverty rates. So a measure of inequality within the lower half by about half or so. Um, fourth, I want to come back to the thing that I started with, the normative argument, and say that because it would enhance economic fairness and it also has public support, and which is now, we know this pretty extensively in the rich democratic countries, um, we should try to reduce any income inequality or, and or wealth inequality. I'm, I'm quite in favor of doing that, especially in my own country where both of these things are so high, both in an absolute sense and a, and a relative or comparative sense. And then lastly, uh, to kind of get more directly at uh, policy implications, um, I think where there's a choice between making people's lives better or doing things that we know make people's lives better and doing something that will reduce income inequality, we should probably opt for the former. If it were the case that income inequality has harmful, uh, you know, substantively significant harmful consequences for all kinds of other outcomes, I'm not sure uh, I would make this choice, but given that the evidence that income inequality has such harmful effects is pretty underwhelming in my view, um, um, this is the conclusion I reach. So for example, what does this mean? Well, I like a lot of other people think that we should probably have a lot more headline indicators that are constantly publicized than simply GDP growth and you know maybe the jobless rate and surely the, the stock market. But I don't actually think in income or wealth inequality would make it into my top 10, let's say. You know, if we had 25, sure. Um, but if we had 25 headline indicators, that's probably too many. People can't pay attention to that many. They're not really headline indicators anymore. So this is one sort of simple and not all that important implication. What else? Well, um, we actually know uh, this is a proposal that I think originally came from Robert Schiller, an American financial economist, but, but others have pointed to it. If we were serious about uh, holding income inequality and possibly also wealth inequality at a lower level, we could adjust tax rates on a regular basis using a simple algorithm that responds to the Gini coefficient or the top 1% share or some composite measure. Um, we could do this and adjust income inequality more or less automatically. There'd probably be a lag time, it wouldn't be perfect, uh, but we could do it. I don't think this would be a particularly good idea though. Same is true with setting a maximum income or wealth, something that's gotten a bit more attention in recent years. There have been a couple of 
books, I think pretty good books, making arguments in favor of this. But I, I don't think it's a good idea. I think it likely would distract for from something that's much more important, which is figuring out how to adjust the tax system to get the most revenue we can from people with higher incomes or more wealth in order to use it for public goods and services and to some degree transfer programs. Same is true with a universal basic income. Um, we could talk if you want about uh, the merits and, and potential drawbacks of a UBI, but if we, if we value or think it's really important to reduce income inequality, we could probably make the, the political trade to uh, get rid of or sharply reduce a variety of public services and exchange them for a UBI. That would immediately and significantly, quite significantly, reduce income inequality, which if it has the effect of boosting health and other living standards and democracy, maybe that would be a good thing to do. Um, but it would probably be problematic in, in terms of uh, the effects of reducing these services that, that have beneficial effects. And again, because uh, I'm not at all convinced, because I don't think the evidence suggests that income inequality does have these other harmful effects, I don't think this would be a good trade to make. Uh, and then I guess two other things, but I'm going to skip over this because it's not it's not all that important. The last thing I want to say, uh, and this comes back to the uh, estimate that income inequality worldwide or on a global scale, that is, if we take all, all the 8 billion or so people in the world as individuals, seems to have declined pretty significantly in the last 20 years. One of the very likely reasons, as best we could tell, for the uh, quite rapid GDP growth in a variety of poorer and middle income countries, which is key to the, the decline in overall income inequality, is their ability to trade with uh, and also some people to migrate to richer countries. Well, these things may or may not, but a number of policymakers are pretty convinced that they do have the effect of increasing income inequality within the rich democratic countries. So again, if reducing income inequality would have valuable consequences beyond just the, the normative or ethical benefit of reducing inequality in and of itself, um, it might be reasonable to cut back on imports from poor or middle income countries or reduce migration from poor or middle income countries in order to reduce income inequality within the rich countries. But that might also have the effect, again, as best we can tell, of increasing income inequality worldwide. I think this is something policymakers ought to take into account in making their decisions. Um, okay, so... I also have some suggestions about if we were going to reduce income inequality, how we should do it, but I, I, I won't go into those here because I'm out of time. Uh, so let me just stop there and hopefully this I've left enough time for some conversation.